Welcome to another edition of Diane Andrews in Black and White, an open discussion about the issues you don't want to talk about and the arts you need to know. Now, here's your host, Diane Andrews. Thank you. I'm your host, Diane Andrews of Diane Andrews in Black and White. I want to thank you all for being here in the audience. I want to thank the YouTube participation because it's been overwhelming for us. We've only been doing this about two and a half months, and we've had over almost 4,000 people watch us on YouTube. As I say, this little unknown girl from a little unknown town, Marouge, Louisiana, I want to thank God and thank everybody, thank our guests for being here, and thank you in TV land. We just got picked up by Metro, formerly Metro 21, the government channel, so we'll start be, being on there. You know we're already in North Louisiana on thought broadcasting. So we're expanding, getting better, we're bringing you the issues you're showing me that you want to know. That's what we want to do, provide you what you need. Issues you don't want to talk about but need to know. We've done bullying twice. We've done ISIS once. We're going to do ISIS again because everything we said was correct in that show. And ISIS is back and now we're back over in Iraq. So let's get started today. As you see, everyone on this panel has a purple ribbon on. That is for Domestic Violence Month. October is Breast Cancer Month. We did that last month. We did a show on, on breast cancer. We are also today doing domestic violence. I want to count nine seconds for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A woman was verbally abused. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A woman was assaulted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A woman was killed. 85% of domestic violence is men against women. 15% though are men, are women against men. A friend of mine who's about 6'6", six, six, and his wife was 5'2", told me she used to beat him up. When I decided to do this show, I thought about my relationships in my life. And I came up with three men that had domestically violated me. One was, and I know Ray Rice, uh, the football player, Roger Goodell, who is the NFL commissioner, is uh, having everyone look at tapes on domestic viol violence, especially the Minnesota Vikings with Adrian Peterson, when he abused his child, they say. And they're calling it domestic violence. But when I looked at this, there was a guy that I was engaged to. He was my partner and he owned nightclubs, that tells you something right there. So he would go out and he would, he would uh, be out and I found out he was dating another woman. I'd call, he wasn't home all night. So you know me, I was in my 20s, most domestic violence happens between the ages of 20 and 24. And I was angry, we were in a heated battle and I slapped him. <laughs> now he'd never slapped me before, even touched me or done anything to me before. And the second time I, he, he tried to hold my arm I was standing on a stairwell. He pushed me back like this. I fell down the stairwell. And I lost 20% hearing in, one, in my right ear. But we dated two years after that. I did not marry him, but he never hurt me again. My hearing, he took me to the doctor. He did everything he could to make the situation right. So I do believe sometimes it doesn't give people a green light to do it but I think I did provoke him. And there's been men who have verbally abused me also. Today our guests though, we have four wonderful guests. I would like to introduce Larry Sweetback Coleman. From the name Sweetback, you all ha have got to know what he's done in his previous life. He was a pimp. Larry is 64 years old. He was in the Vietnam War. When he came back from the war, he was having issues with violence. He was married to his first wife, no problem. He left the life of being a pimp. He left the life of selling drugs. He left the life of being on drugs. And he became a carpenter with his second wife. But PTSD, back in the 70s, post-traumatic stress disorder, people did not know what that was. They did not know how to treat that. And that was part of the issues that he was having with the second wife, police were called. He was a domestic violator. Now he's married to his third wife. He has four children. He's an ordained uh, deacon in the Baptist Church. Thank you for being here with us, Larry. Thank you for having me. Sitting to his right is Loretha Green. Loretha was 
domestically violated. When she was a little girl, her mother's boyfriend, her mother worked in clubs and she was out late a lot at night. Her boyfriend would put her in the bed with him to take the place of his girlfriend, her mother. They would argue a lot. She saw a lot of abuse going on as a child. And what you know sometimes repeats itself. She ended up marrying and partnering with a man and having children for a man who was a domestic violator who violated her many times. And part of his problem was his mother had beaten him as a child. So he had suffered much child abuse as a child. To my left, I have attorney Kent Dejan from La Savio and Dejan Law Firm here. Kent is originally from Opelousas. He is a graduate of LSU's law school. He also uh, worked with the juvenile court system from 1986 to, to, to 1986 to 2002, working with child care cases. Next to him, I have Michaela Simpson, and I think I'm mispronouncing. We're calling her Mickey for this show. Uh, but uh, she was a child, and she was dating a guy up in Eunice, I think is where you're from. And uh, she was in love with the guy, our first love. And she decided to go to Southern University and major in mass communications when she graduated high school. This young man, she was on birth control pills. He told her to stop. You know, domestic violence is about power and control. So she stopped taking her birth control pills. She, she had a child. And she moved back home and lived with him. He beat her. He kicked her. Then, so she left him. And she went on with a second man who did the same thing. She has three beautiful children, and now she's a poet. And we thank her for being here to tell her story. Here in black and white, I like to bring you the counselors, the experts, but I want you to see the people that did it and the people that it happened to. Because nobody knows better the pain that they felt than they do. So we're going to start with you, Loretha. Let's tell you your story. Um, well, like you mentioned before, um, I saw a lot of abuse as a child. And uh, it repeated itself as I got older. Um, in that relationship with my children's father, um, it was very, very volatile. He was very controlling. Um, I was pretty much, it was like being in a prison. I just didn't know how to get out of. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now you, are, you have a degree in theology now, and you did all of this after that relationship, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. So did, was he the breadwinner? Did you work? Or he was the main breadwinner? He was. He didn't uh, want me to work or go to school or do anything to better myself. He this pretty much. Economic co coercion is another part of domestic violence. You know, mm -hmm. there's abuse and there's economic abuse also, along with the verbal, the emotional, and the assault and battery. Um, so, how did you finally get away from this man? Well, after uh, I just talked with God and I said, Lord, you know, if uh, he comes, he used to gamble. If he comes back again and he puts his hand on me one more time, uh, give me strength to, to just leave. And he did. I had on this white T-shirt and he beat me and it was full of blood. And the next morning he went to work and I found the strength and the courage to leave. How many and, children did you have and how old were they? Uh, I had three at the time. They were four, three, and one. And when I left, I was pregnant again. Wow. And so you have four children for this man. Yes. Are you still in communications? Has he changed? Has he become he a better changed. person? He has changed. We're friends now. Um, I think that was something that he had to work through, you know, issues. Um, because of his childhood? Because of his childhood, yes. And so uh, we're friends now. We don't have any, um, I don't hold any, like, animosity. For, yes. Yeah. I've forgiven him. Uh, we've moved on. and. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, wonderful kids, but yeah. uh, we just couldn't live together. It was, it was just. Did he not good. did he marry? Uh, no, no. So you he don't think you don't know whether he's doing it now? You think he's? he's I changed. know recent, as of five years ago, that relationship had some violence in it. So I know that he's still working through some, some of his issues. issues. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry. Yeah. Tell us, when you were on drugs, you had plenty of fast money, plenty of fast women, and plenty of fast cars. Yeah. And you had that Afghan dog. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, Larry, how did you get out of that life? Well, um, I came to a, a reality that the life and the lifestyle that I was living was one that was beyond me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew that I could be a better person. I wanted to be a better person. And uh, I had some issues that was going on with me that I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of. I didn't know anything about PTSD. Right. You know, uh, 
I, I was under the impression that I was a drug addict, mm -hmm. you know, and... But you were also, right? Yeah. You are also a drug yeah, addict. Yeah, I, I, and that was the cause of my issues, mm -hmm. you know. But after I got off drugs, I still had the issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I was very uh, ignorant mm -hmm. to the fact... But most of the community was in the 70s. They had yeah, not right. named... Uh, widespread that doctors knew how to deal with that. You're on medication now and have counseling, I think, yes. through the Veterans yes. Administration. Yes. And at that time, uh, the VA didn't even uh, look at it as being PTSD. You know, uh, they would say you're shell shot, mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know. Um, and when I came back Did from Did they have here, any solution for to get out of this shell shot? No. Okay. Uh, when we came back from Vietnam, uh, it wasn't no therapy, no uh, debriefing or anything like that. They just, right. just came back home and you went back into society. Right. You know, and with all these issues. Mm -hmm. um, I went into Vietnam at 18 years old, you know. Southern boy, never been out of Louisiana right. before, you know, and never killed anybody, right. you know. Uh, Did you have to do that yeah. in Vietnam? Did uh, that bother you? Yeah, today. You came back, it still, still does do. today. Yeah. Uh, Vietnam has never really been declared a war, I don't think, has it? A real war? Did they ever declare it a war? <laughs> it was more than a war. Right. Yeah. But it was insanity. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you uh, didn't know who your enemy was. You could, right. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time, <laughs> and not want to sound prejudiced or anything, but mm -hmm. at the time, with me, in, in my experience, I had two wars going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I was from the South, had been oppressed all my life, seen right. oppression. You know, and From I go Baton into, Rouge, specifically, yeah, Louisiana. Yeah. yeah, I was in the civil rights age. Mm -hmm. I was raised up where uh, black people got oppressed and abused by the police and mm -hmm. everybody, you know. and I just did a show on Walking While Black. Yeah. And some of that still and Then happens. I go into the military and, uh, and, I, and I'm trained to kill people that never called me a nigger. Yeah. That never done me anything. Right. And then I got people that I'm fighting with that's calling me a nigger every day. Right. You know, and uh, you know, it's, you're trying to deal with all this at 18 years old. You right. know, you're trying to uh, distinguish the difference between who you're really supposed to be fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, let's talk though more. Let's get back yeah, to because I think the VA, I'm going to do a show on uh, veterans. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about how did you feel when you were abusing uh, your second wife, and you still have some problems today with your third wife. Now, you've been to jail before. Yeah. But also, you also told me, too, people don't realize that sometimes maybe the woman, your second wife or whoever, may not be telling the truth all the time about what you've done to her, and she doesn't say what she's done to you. Right. Uh, Diane, in my experience, mm -hmm. the law perpetrates a lot of domestic violence. Why do you, and we'll talk to Kent, be keeping this under your hood here. Because uh, now... Nowadays, the game has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, you can call the police and say that he put his hands on me. Whether you put your hands on mm -hmm. her or not, they come at you. Mm -hmm. and they come at you like they mean it. Right. You know? I've heard a lot of men say this. Yeah. And uh, me and my wife were getting to it, you know, and I've been trained to take away the breath, you know. Right. So I've never been a w woman beater, which I, uh, the police, called me a wife beater, but I'm but not a wife beater. But that's what she said, right? Right. But you didn't beat her, you choked her. I choked her. I mean, and it's still bad. Yeah. It's still bad, right? Don't get me wrong, yeah. I'm not justifying or rationalizing yeah. my behavior by no means, you right. know. I'm very ashamed of that, that I ever put my hands on a woman, right. you know. But the fact of the matter is, it, it was the disease that I suffered right. from and the training that I've had mm -hmm. that caused me to react the way that I react, you know, and I have explain that mm -hmm. you know baby please don't do this to me you know or uh, I can't deal with this. As I said this, when I know? slapped that fiance yeah. Yeah. he'd never hit me before mm -hmm. never hit me after that mm -hmm. but sometimes we can incite I know women have and I have uh, done this have a tendency to verbally abuse men because we we know their hot spot right. when we're mad we right. go after the hot spot and I'm, I'm a lot better right. than I used to be when I was young but people tend to do that right. like Ray Rice's wife now right. who was his fiance when he slapped her and hit her and pulled her dragged out of the elevator mm -hmm. the NFL player but she did say she incited him but there was no cause for what he did to her right. I know you know I don't right. and again I'm not saying I it's right Mm -hmm. But sometimes anyone has a, a threshold. 
And my wife had a favorite word. She would tell me that the only weapon a woman have is her mouth. What about sex? People usually say we have sex <laughs> as a weapon, don't we? But I, I, I'm trying to explain to her, if your mouth is going to get you in trouble, why don't you shut it up? Let me let Kent address this. Let's address that a little bit, Kent, some of his issues. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, when it comes to domestic abuse, mm -hmm. the, the state recently, I, when I say recently, since I started practicing law 25 years okay. ago, um, this has been an issue that over time uh, the legislature has seen more of a need to address. Mm -hmm. and, and basically what has happened is there's been uh, an evolution of enacting laws recently. Mm -hmm. You know, 25 years ago, domestic abuse was something very secretive, right. very quiet, because culturally people just, you know, did these things behind closed doors. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, 25 years ago, women were more dependent upon men, mm -hmm. and so they just didn't go out and talk about these things. Right. In today's society, in today's world, mm -hmm. you know, we see domestic abuse being presented in the media. Mm -hmm. We see bullying. We see right. all types of things going on. And, and one so, thing I noticed during the bullying show, and <laughs> there are a lot of reasons, they're not all excuses, Again, he had a, a sickness. Mm -hmm. And bullies, little bullies, turn into big bullies if there's no help. And a lot of those bullies still more power and control. It's the same phenomenon, domestic violence or bullying. That's right. And, and, and with regard to, to the statutes, you'll see that there are now seven different statutes mm -hmm. dealing with this particular issue and, and, and giving self-help to people, mm -hmm. uh, criminal statutes. Mm -hmm. You're going to see statutes dealing with abused or neglected children in the Children's Code. So there, there are seven different statutes or laws enacted by the legislature mm -hmm. trying to deal with this particular issue. Um, and so you see that there is a concern about it. Now, uh, you know, it, it, you raise a good point. Uh, first of all, the state is very concerned about protecting people who are abused mm -hmm. because obviously they're in a situation that they need all the assistance a lot of times they can get. Whether it's but, a man or the woman. Whether it's a man or a woman, that's correct. But like you stated earlier. The other concern the legislature has is what about these frivolous claims coming up? Where right. you may have a woman that comes in, or a man, who comes in and says, oh, these thing, bad things happen, may not have happened as they said or didn't happen. And so the legislature tries to strike a balance between the two, mm -hmm. giving access to people who want to complain. But there are also provisions in the law that if you lie, that you can be imprisoned, mm -hmm. you can be fined, um, they can sanction you. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's certainly not something <clears throat> I would do as a person. I would not file a false complaint with the law enforcement or anyone else. Now, the question becomes, you know, obviously the problem that you have with these types of situations is it becomes he said, right. she said. Yeah. Right. And then when you start getting into that, it is very difficult to kind of piece through this right. and try to figure out what's correct or not. And so it, sometimes it's hard to sanction people. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, any time you're dealing with serious uh, complaints about uh, sexual or, or physical abuse, it is only natural that if there is some validity to it, if it's close, a lot of times you're going to find that the finder of fact is going to err on the part of the person, the victim, because they're who concerned. Who they believe is the victim. Who they believe is the victim. Yeah. That's correct, because yeah. they're concerned. They don't, they don't want to be the one that, that gets, you know, that this happens again. Right. And then all of a sudden, the legislature's on their, their doorstep saying, this judge let this person get away. It gets to be away. a messy business. It can be very difficult, yeah. yes. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back to talk to Mickey on her experiences. Thank you. We'll see you in a few seconds. Thank you. Thank you for coming back when we were out on the break. We had an interesting conversation between Sweetback, <laughs> the old Sweetback Larry, and, uh, and, and our attorney, Kent here. Uh, let's talk about if both people are fighting and the police are called, who goes to jail? That's a good question. This is the general rules mm -hmm. of engagement. Mm -hmm. First of all, words are never sufficient provocation. Okay. If you and I get into an argument, I can call you whatever I want to call you, okay? However, uh, that is never justification for you to hit me. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as soon as one of us raises a hand and hits the other, mm -hmm. at that point we have a battery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the other party, in response to being hit, has the right to reasonably defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in other words, you hit me first. Okay. I can't go I'm, get a gun and kill you. No. I mean, you hit yeah. me first. I'm allowed to defend myself, mm -hmm. and I can use physical. Uh, force mm -hmm. to defend myself, but it must be reasonable. In other mm -hmm. words, if all you do is slap me, yeah. and I can have a reasonable chance to escape, I, I'm not obligated to escape, run away. But that should be the first but course of action. The course of action. If you can, you yeah. should try to escape. Now, if yeah. you can't, you are allowed to use reasonable force. Yeah. Now, once I'm I want, I want to move on to Mickey a second, yes. <laughs> and um, and you might could address some of her issues that she has. She was a a, t a teenager when she was first abused and she continued because she wanted a family structure. Let's hear your, what do you think as a young lady. She, uh, Mickey's only 27 now. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to say that I believe um, from hearing their stories also that there are so many fragmented people mm -hmm. that it makes it easier to spin in the cycle, to continuously spin in the yes. cycle of either abuse, self-destruction, et cetera, things like mm -hmm. that. And I think once we fix our inner issues, mm -hmm. then we can limit that's all of right. this that's and going that's on. And that's a hard, that's the hard, it, it, it is. the hard issue, fixing yourself when some people don't think they're broken. Exactly. So, so with you, you were young, and I know you wanted a family structure so, because your grandparents raised you. Yes, ma'am. I um. From an early age, my parents separated whenever I was in the fourth grade. Before that, my father was in the military, fought in Desert Storm. He also suffers from PTSD. Mm -hmm. But as a child, you know, I was unaware of that. I thought he was just mean. I resented right, him, right. you know, for that. And so I grew up, I guess, n naturally, out of habit, you seek what you don't have. That's you know? right. So I went out looking for that. and. I think there's the same jump off the porch when you so you don't know anything. So right. the first person I met, I I thought that was I thought that was love. You know, you get the butterfly feelings, and We've that's all just been all there. the yeah. <laughs> yes. So I went with that, and it's I guess maybe maybe abusers they can sense that brokenness in someone else. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, if you have that, your healing is through your writing. Yes, ma'am, it's through Let my me see writing. Your your book. Okay, I am, and you do the spoken word. I met her at the yes, Lucas Foundation. Uh, last week, and uh, tell it's us going, how this helps you heal. I've been writing since I I was younger. Third grade, I started writing. I always knew um, whenever I was five, my mother read to me Lorraine Hansberry. Where can they get this book? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, okay. on internet outlets. But there is a Hemingway quote that says, "We are made stronger at our broken places." That's right. So basically, through my writing, I go back to my broken places, mm -hmm. and in turn, it heals me. And I find people read it. That's my story. Yeah, as you know. they say, if it doesn't uh, kill you, uh, if it makes you stronger. We have the domestic hotline number up. Please write this down if you need to talk to anyone and have counseling. Thank you very much, and we'll be right back with another segment. Hopefully this helped. Thanks for coming back with us. I think on the domestic violence segment we just finished, I wanted you all to know that over half of the domestic violence, people are either on drugs or have been drinking. So we all need to take heed and look. And when we see something going on with a child that may not be quite right, let's make sure we get people help when they need help. But in this segment, you all know I always like to do a little splash of color in black and white with a splash of color and I bring in the film industry people, the music industry, the writers. Today I'm honored to have with me a Baton Rouge native, Mr. Henry Turner Jr. He is not only a soulful reggae singer and guitar player, he has his own company. I'm going to let him talk to you about it. He's an artist and a businessman. He is Louisiana's ambassador in the music industry, so well, he's going to tell us what that means. Thanks for being here today with My us, pleasure, Henry. Dan. Tell us about everything going oh, on. Well, where do I start? I guess I'll start with how it started. You know, for me, music is, uh, you know, it's like food for the soul. Mm -hmm. So I'm a singer-songwriter by nature. You know, I like to uh, 
create music that's designed for all demographics. I like to make sure that uh, I have uh, music for children, mm -hmm. music for the middle demographics, and some music for the elderly. So I write from those perspectives. Oh, okay. I started as a soul uh, bluesy type performer here in Baton Rouge years ago. But then, uh, 1997, I got the opportunity to tour with the annual Bob Marley Festival tour. Which tour? Annual Bob Marley Festival oh, tour. Oh, Bob Marley, okay, yeah. 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 So um, with that tour, we had the opportunity to tour like 22 U.S. cities, and we did that from 1997 to 2005. And, and the advent of that particular tour, it turned us into national you know, recording artists. Um, then, um, you know, after being on that tour for years, we were exposed to so much media, so much uh, distribution, uh, PBS, television stations, the whole nine, uh, we became a tour phenomenon. So we... What would be your hit uh, song that people would recognize out there in the audience? Well, we're what's called a middle type act. We're not, we haven't had like a bona fide hit. Yeah. But we're not a local band and haven't had any exposure. The, okay. the biggest songs that we had in the local regional area was uh, songs like Poor Man. Uh, it was a song that E. Rodney Jones loved a lot when he was at WXOK, and he broke the song. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the on the regional and national end, we have songs like Modern Medication that were built for, like, the uh, the medical marijuana industry. Oh, okay, And if yeah. you go past uh, Texas into Arizona, then, you know, we it know. It's really big out there where there yeah, is legal we're, medical We're known for that. Yeah. We're known for that. that if there's something you, uh, you would like to leave with the audience, where you're going to be playing very soon, let's leave it out there, or any number you'd like to tell them, to reach sure. you? Um, a good way, a good way to really find out and look at my history and who I am is just Google me, Henry Turner Jr. Oh, okay. and Flavor. And uh, Louisiana State Fair tonight. Oh, okay, Flavor. Louisiana State Fair tonight. And mm -hmm. let's Google Henry Turner, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you for being here, Henry. My pleasure. All right. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed the show today. We had a lot of brave people, a lot of survivors, three survivors, come in and tell their story, a very touching story, and I know it brings them back a lot of pain, but all of them have succeeded and moved on in their lives and are doing wonderful things. Now I want to end, as I tell you, between every black and white, there are shades of gray, and I saw this as a little girl growing up in Marouge, Louisiana, that says if everyone went lit just one little candle, what a bright world this would be. So let's go out and make it a bright world. <laughs>